أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأفضل الصلوات وأتم التسليم على سيدنا ونبينا وحبيب قلوبنا وطبيب نفوسنا أبي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد عيد مبارك to you all on this very very happy occasion the birthday anniversary of Amir al-Mu'mineen wa Mawla al-Mawahideen Al-Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam Inshallah may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the tawfiq and the opportunity to be able to uh, perform ziyara of his holy shrine in this dunya and receive shafa'a from him in the akhirah for the purpose of receiving uh, blessings and to oversee the success of uh, our progress in learning the ahkam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala I would like to start our program with reciting dua al-faraj in calling for the hastening of the reappearance of sahib al-asri wa zaman Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Allahumma kun li waliyika al-hujjat ibn al-Hasan salawatuka alayhi wa ala abaih في هذه الساعة وفي كل ساعة وليا وحافظا وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه أرضك طوعا وتمتعه فيها طويلا برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وآله الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد We have so many أحاديث from أهل البيت عليهم السلام that emphasize on the importance of al-tafaqquh fi deen which means for one to learn about affairs of religion in reality when we look at the root words of uh, fiqh in the arabic language it literally means to learn to understand it won't come up again inshallah so uh, there are verses in the Holy Quran that uh, make reference to uh, tafaqqu. Um, there are ahadith that speak about fiqh, and it literally means to understand. Fiqh or al tafaqqu means to understand. So a faqih would uh, mean one who understands. Now, this, of course, evolved into a, a technical term uh, that makes reference to a certain science. And that science is the science of jurisprudence or Islamic um, religious, religious law. Um, so anything to do with the realm of sharia uh, would be studied in fiqh now when we look at the ahadith like for example we have one hadith that um, shows how the exaggerated level of how our imams emphasized on uh, the necessity of learning about ahkam imam sadiq alayhi salam to show this uh, exaggerated emphasis, he uh, had said that if I was able to, I would get a whip and stand over my Shia and force them to learn about matters and affairs of their religion. To uh, exaggerate the emphasis on the necessity of al tafaqquh to learn about affairs of religion and what better way of uh, what better subject what better topic there is than for one to learn about matters of halal and haram because it is these very things that bring about uh, one's uh, closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because if we were to um, sketch it in this particular way, absolutely every single thing uh, that we do as human beings can 
be drawn in this particular way. And this up here we would write uh, God. Hopefully you can read that. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna change the change the brush. God and down here we would say Iblis so looking at this there are certain things that would bring about that absolute satisfaction of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it is what he has ordained for us human beings and it falls within the category of our actions because as Muslims we uh, look at absolutely everything we do on a hourly basis on a minute basis based on this category of whatever would please God or whatever would displease God. Something that has a 100% level of um, pleasing of Allah subhanahu ta'ala that will bring about God's content that will also make him happy and satisfied we call that act wajib something that is 100 percent displeasing by god and something that god would be discontent about that would not please him in any way that it would displease him we call that haram I hope you all like my handwriting we call that haram what does wajib mean it means obligatory what does haram mean it means prohibited then there are certain things that really make God happy that bring about God's content but he's a little bit flexible and he said Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he says that it's very good if you do it I advise you to do it I recommend you to do it but if you don't have to you don't have to do it if you don't want to you don't have to do it if you do do it, you will be rewarded. And if you don't do it, you will not be punished. And what do we call this? We call this Mustahab. Then on the other side, there are things that God does not like to be done. He doesn't like you to do it and he says I advise you I recommend that you stay away from it however if you were to perform it then you will not be punished if you if you do refrain from performing it you will be rewarded and this is called makruh Then there are things that are pretty much in the middle. God has said, you know, whether you do it or whether you don't do it, you're not going to be rewarded or punished or anything else. It's totally up to you. And that's here in the middle of the line. And this is called Mubah. So let's translate and give examples of what each one of these uh, are um, wajib is obligatory and 
an example for wajib. Can anyone give me an example for wajib, please? You can type it if you want to. Prayer, salah, Prayer. very good. Prayer, very good. Very good. So wajib is obligatory. And then the other one, other side, is haram. And that's called forbidden in English. Prohibited, forbidden, doesn't matter. And an example for haram is drinking alcohol. Good. Everyone's saying alcohol, so <laughs> eating pork. Oh, that's, that's a better example, maybe. Everyone's alcohol. It's like we're deprived of alcohol. Music, uh, Hajj Samia, you know, haram music is haram. Yeah, that's right. That we can We can say that, yes. Then we have mustahab. Mustahab means recommended and it is something where you will be rewarded if you perform it, but not punished if you do not perform it. Can anyone give an example of something mustahab? Dua, Salatul Layl, very good. Very good. Sadaqa, paying charity, is mustahab. Uh, fasting during the holy month of Rajab is very mustahab. And so on and so forth. How about makruh? Makruh means disliked. And it means that it is recommended for you to avoid it. If you do avoid it, you will be rewarded. And it won't be a bad thing that you're performing. But if you do do it, then uh, you will um, not be, if you do do it, then you will not be puni punished. What's an example of makruh for makruh? What's an example for makruh? Sleeping on a full stomach. Very good example. Also, sleeping after fajr. Another good example. Sleeping on your stomach is another good example uh, very good sleeping at maghrib time another good example all examples to do with sleeping then we have mubah being idle what does that mean yeah any wasting time <laughs> i don't know about that <laughs> Then we have mubah. Mubah in English means neutral. And it means that it is neither of any of the four other categories. So you classify this act as something neutral. It's not haram. It's not wajib. It's not mustahab. It's not makruh. It's mubah. What's an example of mubah? Can anyone give an example of mubah? House chores. It's a bit ambiguous, that example. Working for women. Eating. Oh, Sister Zainab, how could you say eating and drinking is mubah? Let's be specific in the example that we're giving. Because that's very ambiguous. Drink, watching, having tattoos. No, actually... Sister Aya, having tattoos falls under this category. Okay. Let, let's give this example. With eating, you can eat kebab or you can eat salad. You're, it's mubah. You want to eat kebab, you want to eat salad. Or... You drive to university or you catch a bus to university. Is it wajib? Is it mustahab? Is it makuru? No. Is it haram? No. It's mubah. You want to choose to drive or you want to choose to um, catch a bus. You want to ride? You want to walk? You want to eat salad for breakfast or you want to eat kebab for breakfast? That's totally up to you. These are 
uh, examples of mubah. So, as Muslims, everything that we do, absolutely everything that we do, needs to fall under one of these five classifications. It needs to fall under one of these five classifications. What you do on a minute basis is one of these five. Now, can something wajib become something haram? Question. Yes or no? No. Yes. We've got different ulama having different views here. Yes. Maybe. Oh, that's a good that's a good one. Maybe. Okay. Gray area. Okay, what would an example be of something? Salah when impure, for example. That wouldn't be that wouldn't become haram. That would just be invalid. That would be invalid. So you have um let's stick with the example of salah you are praying and that is wajib for you to pray yes ob obedience of parents is wajib of course but i'm saying can something that is wajib become forbidden you're praying and you have someone who is drowning right salah is wajib but then according to secondary law secondary ruling saving a drowning person is more wajib or pig alcohol they are haram to consume so they are the primary law here is that they are haram to consume now, what happens if you are in a remote desert and there is absolutely nothing around except for a little um, pig running around and a bottle of vodka? It becomes wajib for you to consume those haram things to keep your life. In order to stay alive, it becomes wajib for you to consume haram, right? Now, of course, this would mean that you don't have any halal around you. You don't have any water. It's only that bottle of vodka. And also, it doesn't mean that you go all crazy on the pig and make pork and bacon and this and that. No, you eat enough for you to survive. And you don't drink the whole bottle of vodka, so you start walking all drunk. You drink according or enough for you to survive only. So it's not you filling yourself up, but only for the purpose of survival. We can also change something makruh to mustahab, something mustahab to makruh, and so on and so forth. Mubah. Consume, yes, it, it would if in, it's not a choice, no. So if a person is in a life-death situation and the only thing next to them is something haram and they know that if they don't eat this, they don't drink this, then they will die, then it becomes wajib for them to keep themselves alive. So hayat and life is more important than any any anything else as for mustahab sorry as for mubah there are many things that we do on a daily basis that is mubah but we can change something from something to something else purely based on the niyyah and the intention that we have um, based on your intention, based on your niyyah, something that was 
from this side can easily become that mubah for example it's mubah for you to walk or drive it's mubah for you to drink a cup of water but if you say I am going to drink this cup of water qurbatan ila Allah ta'ala for the sake of God in order for me to uh, have the strength to be able to um, serve my guests to be able to perform acts of worship to be able to um, live a life an honorable life so I can uh, be able to uh, do good to other people or I'm drinking water and I remember the thirst of Imam Hussein Salam. all of a sudden this mubah becomes mustahab it becomes a recommended act and you have received the rewards and you say I am going to go to university for the sake of learning and education and education is obligatory in Islam so I am doing something recommended or maybe even obligatory like this lesson here this lesson is not mubah for uh, us it is either wajib if you don't know about these things or it's mustahab and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Holy Quran وَقُلْ رَبِّي زِدْنِي عِلْمَا Oh Allah increase me in my knowledge so it's a recommended thing it's a mustahab thing for one to increase in their knowledge or it could be for many it's wajib and this is why all of our scholars say it is wajib aini to learn the ahkam and the laws of the sharia inshallah this is clear with everyone there are stories of some great ulama some great scholars who for 40 years of their life 50 years of their life they did not perform one mubah let alone makruh or haram so absolutely everything they did fell under the category of wajib or mustahab working for the sake of going to, for hajj and ziyara is mustahab it's mustahab of course working is mustahab well, it's a good thing someone who works so they can earn a halal income so they can live an honorable life so they are able to sustain themselves so they are able to help and pay uh, the zakat and the khums and travel for ziyara and hajj and everything else it's of course it's mustahab it all comes down to a person's niya by having tawakkul and relying on god and purifying oneself then they are able to change something simple uh, simply mubah into a mustahab or a wajib another issue i don't want to confuse you but there are a lot of things that we can also speak about can something we the first question was can something that is wajib become haram and we gave examples and something haram become wajib we gave examples can something be haram and wajib at the same time no is that right all of our maraja taqlid sisters say no oh sister batul is saying yes okay but um so those who said yes or those who said no why can anyone explain why you can use the microphone if you want to you can't please iblis and god at the same time okay okay let's say that there are two scenarios here one scenario is that that very wajib thing is 
in itself haram that of course is impossible but combining a wajib thing by also in it there being something haram entailing something haram is also possible like for example it's wajib for you to pray but you are praying with usurped clothes you are praying on usurped land this one's wajib from one aspect from one angle and the other one is haram from another angle another example you are praying you're performing your wajib salah and a non-mahram lady walks past this isn't applicable to you sisters but just giving the example a non-mahram lady walks past and you sorry and he <laughs> sorry and he looks at her a lustful way he's doing his wajib his salah will not be uh, invalid but he has committed a haram act by looking in a lustful way to a non-mahram woman is that clear inshallah with everyone sisters and sisters yes Batul is right as long as you were thinking of these examples and you didn't just guess alhamdulillah so let's carry on inshallah and um, look into the philosophy of fiqh today's lesson most of it is the philosophy of fiqh because we need to understand something fundamental and that is that we're not only concentrating on oh haram wajib hala this that that's one thing that is uh, important in our lives but all of this comes after we have built something and that thing that we have built is the foundation of our religion the foundation of our religion uh, means that the foundation of our religion means that we have made sure that there is a good fundamental establishment that I am going to be building my house on that's a unconventional roof by the way <laughs> if I'm going to be building it on sand what's going to happen with the house it's not going to be stable in any way if I'm going to be building it on a good foundation, then the house will be, uh, will grow very well. However, what happens um, if I don't have that foundation? And this is why when it comes to um, our religious teachings, we look at it as far as it being a tree what is the basis of the tree the roots then you have the tree and then on the tree you have the branches what's more important the branches or the foundation of course it's the foundation this foundation we call usul these branches we call furu so which one precedes the other which comes first 
usul comes first. And that's why we believe in usul ad din or the foundations, the fundamentals of religion. The foundations or the fundamentals of religion start off with believing that reason and rationality and your intellect, logic, common sense, these are the things that you use as a tool to understand the foundation. You don't use anything else. You can't follow someone else. You cannot imitate anyone. You can't just come up with it out of nowhere. It needs to come from critical thinking, from your intellect, from your rational understanding, common sense, logic, and all of these other words that we can use. Why? Because that is the only thing that all human beings share. Every human being on the face of this earth has an intellect and rationality and reason. If you were to ask any human being, what does one plus one equal? They will say two. Is a big bigger than a small? They will say yes. Can two contradictory things be one? No. Can something black be white? No. It's either black or it's white or it's grey. It can't be black and white at the same time. So all of this comes from intellect, reason, common sense, rationality. Hey, excuse me, this don't make sense. Does this make sense? Does that make sense? Let's have a look at it in a different way and all of these other examples that we can give. And therefore, if someone was to say, well, you know, I'm trying to find out uh, about God and you're telling me that God exists. And I've heard about this Trinity example that Christians come up with. And they say, you know, you've got God the Father, you've got God the Son, and you've got God the Holy Spirit. And they are three entities, but in reality they are one. But in reality that one is three. I'm going to say to you, mate, that just don't make no sense. If... You're saying that they are one, but they are three, but they are one. I'm not going to accept it through reason. The reply that is given by Christian theologians is that this is based on faith. It is not based on reason. And this is why Islam says that our religion is a reason-based religion, not a faith-based religion. So if you were to question the concept of Trinity, they will say, acknowledge Jesus as your Savior, believe in him as your Savior, because he died for your sins, and then you can think about whether or not it makes sense. But the triggering factor of you acknowledging or accepting a Trinity is not reason, but faith. Whereas the Islamic approach to this is, no, it needs to make sense. It needs to be based on reason and intellectual deduction and logical precepts in order for me to Accept it. And this is why the concept of Tawheed, the concept of believing in a monotheism or a one unique united God is purely rational. 
Now, when we understand this, we come to also uh, know that God has a purpose in life and in creation. He created the earth, and we know that by us being an effect of his creation. So God, who is all just and all knowledgeable and all wise, would not create us without a purpose. What is this purpose? God says, I'm going to send down representatives who are my agents, who speak on my behalf, and they will explain to you what the purpose of life is. And I'm going to call them prophets because I give them revelation. And be careful. Be aware that while you are living in this life, you have a duty and a responsibility and there's going to come a time where you will be accountable for all of this and that is called judgment day so this gives us a whole universal understanding of usul usul ad-din the fundamentals of our religion where Tawheed, which means monotheism, believing in one God, and God doing things with a purpose, and him being fair and just, which is Adl, and then him sending down prophets consecutively, and that's called Nubuwa, because a prophet in Arabic is Nabi, and then there being a judgment day, and that is called Ma'ad. Of course, when I'm with number four on the concept of Imama, that is a extension of Nubuwa, where in the continuation of the plan of God, there always needs to be someone who represents him. Of course, as you know, what constitutes you as a Muslim is Tawheed, Nubuwa, and Ma'ad. Why? Because, sorry, because there are some Muslims who do not believe in Adl, and there are some Muslims who do not believe in Imama. What did we say Adl meant? Can anyone tell me? Being just. Being fair and just, very good. So, question, how could some Muslims not believe in Adl? Shall we go there or shall we not go there? What, yes? Yes, what? Yes, we should go there. <laughs> Go there. ISIS is a great example. No, I, I wouldn't say ISIS is a great example. This is a whole discussion on its own. Yeah, you're right, Sister Yusreen. But seeing that the sisters have requested we go there, um, I'm just going to be very, very brief. So, in our... Um, let me open up this again. So, in... Islam, as far as usul is concerned, there are two main branches, the Sunni and the Shia. Okay? The Sunni and the Shia. Okay, in the Sunni theological, I'm going to write theology here, theo, sorry, theology, can everyone read that, <laughs> that looks like a D, anyway, I think I should use the whiteboard, should I use the whiteboard or should I stick with this?
the Sunnis have two theological sects. One is the Mu'ta, sorry, Mu'tazila, Mu'tazila, and the other one is the Ash, Ashaira. Mu'tazila is one group, Ashaira is another group. They are theological groups. And this means that the Mu'tazila, they had certain be theological beliefs, and the Ashaira, they had certain theological beliefs. Most Sunni Muslims nowadays, even though they probably might not know, are Ash'aris. The Mu'tazila are closer to the Shia. Because both the Shia and the Mu'tazila are called the Adliya. And them being the Adliya means they believed in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being Adil. Whereas the Ashaira said that God is not Adil or in reality they said that God doesn't need to be Adil we'll get let's let's explain the Shia the Shia groups first does anyone know the Shia theological groups Anyone? No. No, not based on the Quran. The different Shia, the different Shia theological groups. Yes, very good. Ismaili is one. Ithna Ashari is another one. Alawi is another one. Jafari. Who are, who are the Jafaris? The Jafaris are the Ithna Asharis. Baha'i is not a uh, theological sect. Baha'i uh, is away from Islam altogether. So they're not, they're not even Muslim. So very good, Alawis, Zaydis, uh, Hashmi, what's a Hashmi? Alawi, Zaydi, Ismaili, Ithna Ashari, um, they are the main uh, Shia theological sects. And within each one of these there are other subsects. Like, for example, with the Ismailis, you've got the Agha Khanis, and you've got the Dawoodis, and you have the Buhra, and with the Zaydis, you also have difference. You, with the Alawis, you have the Turkish Alawi, and you also have the Syrian Alawi, uh, and so on and so forth. What did the Mu'tazilis, the Ash'aris say? The Ash'aris say that God is God. Who are you or me to tell God what God can do or what God wants to do. If God, who is God, wants to sell a right send a righteous person to hell, he can if he wants to. God can do whatever he wants. And if God wants to send a sinful person to heaven, then he can if he wants to. So God is not just being just means to give everyone their due rights. If you are sinful, you will be punished. If you are righteous, you will be rewarded. But this means that we are dictating unto God what it is that he should or should not do. And therefore, God is not just. This is the misconception that uh, the Ash'aris had 
Yes, Sister Ruby, you, if you log out, you can come back in. Just use the same name. So um, this is the misconception that the Ash'aris used. Anyway, I don't want to confuse you and, and go into that, as the other sister said, that this is a whole topic on its own. But it's very important. So this is the um, theological groups in Islam. How about the um, the jurisprudential groups or the jurisprudential sects in Islam? How about that? Can anyone comment on that? So, very good sister, so with the Sunnis, how many sects are there? How many sects? Four, very good. So with the Sunnis, there are four sects. You've got the Shafi'i, the Hanbali, the Maliki, and the Hanafi. Thank you very much. And with the um, Shia, how many sects are there? Fiqhi sects. And be careful. Be careful with the answer, I mean. How many? Three. What are they? Hajjasamiya. If you're gonna, if you're wrong, you're gonna get in trouble. What are they? Now we already said the Alawi. We already said the Alawis and the uh, and the and the Zaydis. They were the theological sects. Now in the Shia, let's let's uh, sorry. Uh, with the in the Shi with the Shia, we're talking about the Shia Jafari Ithna Ashari, okay? Ithna Ashari, the twelver um twelvers, okay? How many jurisprudential sects are there? There are two. One is called the Usuli, and the other one is called the Akhbari. What does Usuli mean? What does Akhbari mean? This is something that, inshallah, we will uh, learn about. Probably also good idea to um, for it to be your homework as well. Fundamentals of religion. You cannot believe in Imama without you believing in Nubuwa. You cannot believe in Nubuwa without you believing in Tawheed. You cannot believe that there is a judgment day without there being someone who is going to judge. And therefore, when you look at this hierarchy of theological belief, it is not possible for you to look at it independently. One comes after the other, and one is based on the one prior to it. So, we look at it vertically. We look at it vertically, which means one will complement the other, and it is not possible for you to have the lower one without having the higher one. Okay. Whereas with the branches of our religion, first of all, it is not reason based because now that I believe in God and can everyone hear? Can can if you can hear me, can you put a one please, everyone? So 
when we are looking at usul al-din or the fundamentals of religion, one will only be there unless I have the uh, only if I have the one above that. So I look at it vertically. Whereas when it comes, I believe that there is a God, a one God. I acknowledge that God is just. I know that He has sent uh, prophets. I know that these prophets spoke on behalf of God and they were infallible as well. They didn't make error or mistake in any way. They were um, given the command to convey a message and this is what they did and they did so in the best way possible. Now that I have acknowledged this, I submit to the will of God. I submit to what He knows best. I submit to what he knows best, submit, submit, submit. What does submit mean in Arabic? Taslim, Islam, that's exactly what it is. So, now that I have my fundamental reason-based acknowledgement of God, which I believe in, now I have faith. And that's why in the Holy Quran, on many in many occasions, it says, "Ya ayyuhaladina amanu, aminu." Ya ayyuhaladina amanu, aminu. Oh, those who believe, believe. What does that mean? Belief is different to one belief is different to another belief. One belief is, for example, the first belief that you had is reason-based, rational-based intellect-based, common sense. The other one is faith. You've submitted to the will of God, and therefore, he says to you, jump, you jump, sit, you sit, and so on and so forth. However, we do not look at the branches of religion vertically. We look at them as separate, independent categories horizontally one is distinguished and different to the other does one complement the other yes does one give you more benefits in digesting and perceiving the other most certainly yes however if you were to fail in doing one it would not mean that you have failed in doing everything else. It's different to how theology works. Because in theology, if you fail to believe in Tawheed, you're, you fail to believe in Ma'ad. If you fail to believe in, the, in prophets, you are not going to believe in the Imams. Whereas, if you perform one fiqhi act or one act in the branches of religion and you don't perform the other this will not necessarily mean that you have failed in that one that you are performing let's give an example there are many 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 people who do not pray but fast sorry i wouldn't say many 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 people i think i exaggerated there there are people who do not pray regularly, but do fast when it comes to Ramadan and Mubarak, they have to fast. Or, there are some who fast and pray, some sisters for example, some women who fast and pray, but don't observe hijab. Is their prayer valid? Yes. Is their fasting valid? Yes but they are sinning by them not wearing hijab. Of course, for those who, alhamdulillah, all of you are mu'minat, those who um, are not aware of the importance of hijab, hijab is a prerequisite for fiqh, because hijab is involved in hajj, in salah, in all these other things, um, hijab is involved. Why is it? that you cannot pray in your room with the door locked 
knowing with 100% certainty that no man or woman will enter your room. Can you pray without hijab? The answer is no. So there's a reason for that. Inshallah, when we get to salah, we'll speak about that. But what I'm trying to say is that you look at the ahkam horizontally. That one category and not performing it will not affect the other category and its validity. Will it deprive you of spiritual level? It most certainly will. Will it affect you spiritually and morally? It most certainly will. Of course, sister, um, it will uh, if you did not observe, if the person did not observe hijab, but they were doing other wajib acts or refraining from other haram acts. Of course, that is going to be kept as it is. So we look at things vertically and by faith. This is why an uh, important word to uh, learn today is the word, let me tr choose a bigger font, Ta'abud. What does Ta'abud mean? It comes from the word Ibadah. And ibadah means to worship. Ta'abud means devotional or submissive, if you want to use the word submission, submissive. I usually translate ta'abud as devotional. Ta'abudi means it is devotional based. I wouldn't even use the word faith based. It is devotional based. Like for example, when you are circumambulating around the Holy Kaaba, you do it seven times anti-clockwise. Why not clockwise? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said it. When you wake up in the morning, are you more fresh or in the middle of the day or at night? It's when you wake up in the morning, you're more fresh, you're more fresh, you're more energetic. You're more into starting the day. Then why is it that when you wake up in the morning, you want to do two rak'ahs, which is the easiest one. And at the end of the day, which you're very tired and everything else, you are doing seven rak'ahs, four and three. Why is it two? Why isn't it not one? Why isn't it six? Why is it that? Ongoing amount of questions that we can ask, that really is beyond the scope of our human rationality. Does it mean that there is no explanation to it? No, most certainly it doesn't mean that. There is an explanation. There is a reason. Some of them have been given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and by the ma'sumin alayhi wa Most of them have not. Most of them is devotional to test you, to test you how much submission you have. And when you say, I'm going to do it, regardless. It's very similar to the state of a master and a servant. The master says to the servant, I want you to bring me three buckets of water. A servant who's a loyal servant is not going to say, Excuse me, Mr. Master, why didn't you ask me to bring you four? Or why should I have to bring you three? Right? He'll just do it. He okay? I have something else to speak about, but I think that's enough for today. It's ten past nine. I don't want you all to run away next week. Thank you, Sister Batul, for that update. <laughs> Um, I don't want you, or I don't want all of you to run away next week and say Sheikh overloaded us with information, and um, we didn't get much of it. So I'll leave the next five or ten minutes for uh, question and answer time, if anyone has any questions or answers, and um, 
you can turn on your microphones if you want and um, if anyone has anything to say inshallah walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa salatu wa salamu ala sayyidina muhammad wa alihi tahirin allahumma salli ala muhammad wa ali muhammad